I'm uh, oh. I'm happy to present uh, Jill Raphael, who is a Taylor W. Lawrence professor at the <clears throat> at the uh, Caltech. Uh, he's one of the leaders in the theory of low dimensional topological and Plaquet physics. Uh, Jill have made his PhD in university in Harvard University in 2003, and after a short postdoctoral position at University of California at Santa Barbara, he joined the faculty. The, uh, he joined uh, the Caltech as a faculty in 2005. Jill has got a number of fellowships and prizes, including Sloan and Contrail fellowships, the Basel Prize from Humboldt Foundations, and many others. So before we start, let me quickly remind you that uh, uh, questions are welcome in chat window. We won't interrupt the speaker, but Jill will make a couple of uh, stops during the talk. OK, so Jill. Uh, please free to start and we will enjoy the talk. Thanks, thanks very much, Dimitri. Thanks for the invitation. I, I see some familiar faces uh, in uh, among the audience, so good to see you all. So, uh, Gil, can I just interrupt for a second? Um, there's been a, can you see if you can adjust your microphone or, uh, because you're quite, you're a bit quiet. Can you hear me? Yep, that's, that's good. That's that's louder. Hopefully everyone else, that works for everyone else. Can you hear me okay, everybody? That's brilliant. Yeah, good to meet you. Uh, headphones on my computer, but let's not make it stop us. Uh, so I want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to see all several familiar faces uh, as I scroll through the gallery. Um, let me start sharing and hope that you get the right screen. Um, move this here and start the presentation. Can you see the presentation? Yep. Okay. Uh, any, any of you want to keep their microphone on and comment in the middle, go for it. I will stop as Dimitri was saying several times during the talk to us for questions. Um, so it's really a pleasure to tunnel over to Australia uh, in this uh, spring. Uh, and um, yeah, this is, I think, my fourth Zoom talk. So I'm still learning the ropes. So um, if, if you see me looking at the camera, it's because I'm looking for signs of life some, among the audience. So I really appreciate anybody who's uh, visible. So thanks in advance. And, and, you know, noises, background noises are great. So I would not complain. So the talk that I was, uh, uh, the talk that I was, uh, that I wanted to give, kind of recounts uh, my work in the last decade um, on, on the topic of uh, solid state systems interacting with light injected with ideas of topological physics. And as I will try to convince you, the combination of the three give us op new opportunities for controlling phases of electrons, um, controlling photons, and maybe even making new devices uh, so let's see. So this talk is about topology in the slight matter interacting systems. So first of all, let, let's talk for a second about what's topological. So usually when we talk about topology, we talk, talk about some invariant features of um, invariant features of shapes. So for instance, you can take a piece of paper, you can wrap it around into a cylinder, and then you can make a decision whether you want to close in the two sides of the cylinder together to make a sphere or to make the two sides of the cylinder merge with each other to make a bagel, make a torus. And whenever physicists, I think, give talks about topology nowadays, invariably you see a picture that converts a coffee mug to a bagel, which is just, presumably that's just what we love. So that's what we talk about. Some of us also love donuts. So for those of us who love donuts, there's this other version. Um, but you know, topology has been playing a strong role in physics for a while. So where, where do we see topology? So physics of weather, for instance, one place where you can see topology. So 
you know, I'm in Los Angeles, so I don't see this kind of storm, storms very often, but, but you may have. So if it's a touchy subject, I'll go through it quickly. So if you have a hurricane, of course, the velocity field makes a vortex around, um, around the center of the, of the storm, around the eye of the storm. And this is a very stable configuration. So if you want to get rid of this hurricane without nuking it, as you know, an esteemed leader in my country had once suggested, uh, then maybe you want to, you know, you have to either stop the entire air from moving, namely it has to make landfall, or you have to take this eye of the storm out of the storm so that the wind becomes linear, which is much easier to stop, much harder to produce. And both of these things are very hard. And that's why hurricanes are so stable, unfortunately. Now the same kind of physics occurs in superconductors when you try to stick a magnetic field to a type two superconductor, the superconductor will confine the magnetic field into vortices with the electrons making kind of a hurricane motion around the vortex uh, and confine the magnetic field to just a small uh, section in the superconductor, kind of like the eye of the storm. Again, if you wanna get rid of that configuration of current, you have to get rid of the vortices and expel them from the superconductor. And Many of you know that vortex physics has been driving a lot of research in superconductivity, superconducting of, uh, um, of disordered superconductors, as well as applications for superconductivity in high currents. You know, but before continuing, I wanted to point out that other professions also have ideas about uh, topology. So for instance, archeologists. Topology is also important for archaeologists. For instance, take a look at this vase from the Roman Empire era. Take a look at this other vase from the same era. This one, the one on the left, has genus one. The number of holes that it has is one. It costs $12,000. This one has genus two. And, you know, I don't even see a price here. So clearly the genus two means that it makes it be priceless. Uh, wine enthusiasts also have opinions about topology. You can, you can have a carafe with genus zero. You can have a carafe with genus two. And you can even have a carafe with genus one, but, but that looks cool. So people may still want to get it, even though it's an inferior genus. Um, and I assure you that um, the wine tastes differently depending on which genus carafe you have. I think, I think you only want to do white wine in the genus one. Maybe white wines don't even need carafes. Never mind. Uh, let's not forget uh, that, uh, you know, body art, topology also plays a role, but also let's not dwell on it. So what, what's the topology that I want to talk about? Um, let's see. So, so most important for me is spin physics. Uh, so we all know, let, let me just stop before I dive in. Is the sound okay? Yeah, yep, it is. It's good. Okay, good. Uh, I was concerned because my fan is on. So my fan is on, which you may also be hearing. Uh, so if you hear the sound of industry, it's the fan of the computer. Uh, so it's been... Okay. okay, I'll I'll continue. So a spin half is described by a uh, two-dimensional complex vector, basically indicates the direction of where the, the spin is pointing in theta and phi in polar coordinates. Now, the spin could itself find and give us the same kind of topological principle, topological pictures, or maybe topology evoking pictures as the velocity field of a hurricane or the motion of electrons around uh, a vortex uh, gave us. Let me demonstrate that. So, so the spin physics is at the basis of everything that I'll talk about today. So a 1D topological phase requires an orbit coupling. So, so think about the following thing. Uh, let's think about a Hamiltonian uh, that has um, that has momentum coupled to the spin in the z direction. If that's a Hamiltonian of an electron, if it moves to the right, it would want to point up. If it moves to the left, oops, no, I don't want to give up my animation so easily. If it moves to the left, 
it would want to point down, which means that it has, um, which means that it has um, a magnetic field that's momentum dependent, effectively. Now I have to say that, uh, you know, uh, I write spin over a coupled wire, but actually every wire that we can deal with is not made of continuous uh, uh, featureless material, it's made out of a chain of atoms. And therefore the maximum wavelength, that the, the minimum wavelength that an electron can attain really is uh, twice the distance um, between the lattice uh, sites. So the minimum wavelength is twice lattice constant. And that gives rise to a band structure. The momentum states that an electron can take in each band are limited between minus pi over the lattice constant times h bar to plus pi or uh, times h bar over the lattice constant. And these two states are actually the same. There's the state where the electron goes plus, minus, plus, minus. So momentum becomes periodic in a lattice like that. So now if momentum is periodic, kind of like a circle in a two-dimensional space, a one-dimensional circle in a two-dimensional space, um, we can also have the spin winding on that circle, giving us something like a vortex. So let's think about a new spin orbit coupled wire Hamiltonian where the X direction spin couples to cosine of momentum, Y direction spin to the sign of the momentum. And now the eigenstates of an electron in a particular momentum state, they here point in a different direction in the plane, say, for instance, a little bit to the north, a little bit to the right. And this, and this spin direction winds as you go across the one dimensional band structure. So it, it is as if the spin maps a ring as a function of its location on the ring of momentum just like the velocity field of a hurricane. But now instead of real space, we have momentum space where the action happens. Instead of velocity, we have the direction of the spin. This kind of picture underlies most topological phases and certainly all simple topological phases. So just to illustrate this band structure, so in a particular momentum, uh, if we choose a, this particular momentum, we expect an electron to move slowly with the spin pointing to the right. This is this term dominant. As we go to higher momenta, we expect a faster motion because of the group velocity and a spin pointing a little bit more towards the top of the table. To, near the edge of the band, again, slow motion, but with the electron spin pointing completely to the left, almost completely to the left, and then this rotates as we look at the left moving part of the band, again, with different spin directions. So it's not that the spin is winding in space, no, but each momentum state has a different block wave function with the spin pointing in a different direction. And because the momentum is periodic, the, the spin can point, if the spin is forced to point in the XY plane, it can make a very stable configuration in momentum space of winding. Gil, can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so on that previous picture, in the 2D system, I'm happy with the, phase, the, the, the spin orientation winding around a 2D Fermi surface. But if I quantize to a truly one-dimensional system, then how do you get a two-dimensional um, orientation of the spin in a purely one-dimensional system? Oh, so you have to have some symmetry if I understood the question correctly, you have to have a symmetry that restricts the spin to be in a plane. So, so that would be a two-dimensional system, right? In a plane, but if I- if well, no, no, I, so, so, no, no. So, so the, 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 the electron lives in a one-dimensional system, in a one-dimensional yeah. uh, material, but the spin can point anywhere in 3D, in, in, in S2, it can point anywhere in the three-dimensional space. Yeah, sure. But the momentum can only exist in one dimension. That's right. And if you have a spin orbit coupling, then, then you can only have a one dimensional projection of the spin. Ah, no. So, so you look at the Hamiltonian that I have here. Yeah. So, so different components of the spin can couple to different parts, to different functions of the momentum. 
but if you're in one dimension, the the um, the momentum always has to be aligned, say, in the x direction. Oh yeah, but but you can have different dependence, different dependence of the of the magnetic field on the momentum. Okay. So this so this cosine p and sine p is still one dimensional functions, but they look as if p is an angle of a, of a circle. Okay. And you know how how to get this in a physical system is hard. So you have okay. to play games. And uh, the games that people play is the, the spin. So, uh, so, so a lot of people play those games. And in those games, the, the spin that's here with SX and SY is actually a pseudo spin that arises as the low dimensional uh, Hilbert space of systems that, are, that combine several degrees of freedom that are spin-like or superconductivity and spin. And, and somehow there's a subspace that's two dimensional that you can identify as pseudo spin and you can make that Hamiltonian kind of work in it. Now, uh, but by the same token, uh, edge states of two-dimensional systems might have this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, Hamiltonian as well. OK. I, I think my computer is, I'm used to thinking of if I only look at one dimension, then I end up with a one-dimensional projection of the spin. And I can change the magnitude of that projection, but not the orientate. I can only change the spin projection from, say, being plus y to minus y but not rotating in the z direction if the, if the motion is in the x direction. That, that's right. So, so, but I think you can play those games if you have like, if, if your lattice becomes complicated with ligands that provide some strong spin orbit coupling, you can get situations like that as well. Okay. With the momenta, with, with the Bloch wave function sits in different ligand more depending on the momentum that the electrons are in. We can imagine building things like that, but that's different discussion that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. But I'll show you how this arises a little bit. So, so I, I was already uh, mentioning, uh, by the way, any other questions? So far. Uh, I think not yet. Nothing in the chat yet. Okay, great. So one example of such one topological phase is the Kitaev model, which is a spin orbit coupled superconductor. So actually, the, the spin is replaced by Nambu space uh, taus of uh, kind of like, and, and the Bogolyov uh, the Gen equation looks like the Hamiltonian that I showed you before. And what Kitaev showed uh, is that such a model, the, the topology of the model, gives rise to edge states as topological. Uh, Physics always uh, often does, and those edge states in the superconducting case are Majorana fermions. And Majorana fermions can give you topologically protected quantum memory. So that was a great idea by uh, Alexei Kitaev and independently by Mike Friedman. You bring the two, uh, if the two Majoranas are apart, you have no idea what state they're encoding. If you bring them together, you can figure out whether it's a zero or one. This is the basis of topological quantum computing with Majoranas. But it's not the topic of my talk, so I'm going to avoid my runners now and move back to topological uh, spin physics. Okay, so we talked about 1D. Let me show you how the same spin orbit coupling gives rise to 2D topological phases. So here's an example of a Hamiltonian that, that gives rise to a churn band. And again, I have a 3D vector that's a function of two-dimensional momentum dotted into the poly matrices of spin. And simply speaking, let's think of the Hamiltonian Px times sigma x, Py times sigma y, so a magnetic field that uh, locks the spin to the momentum. And in the z direction, one minus momentum squared, the so constant field plus another function that's even of momentum. Now, this gives rise to a valence band, conduction band. And each point in the valence and conduction band has a spin configuration associated with it. And you can ask, does this spin configuration wrap the block sphere? Here's a better illustration. So starting from the gamma point in the valence band, the spin wants to point up. So, uh, well, I guess it's opposite. <laughs> add the minus sign for illustration. Sorry about that. Uh, so over here, this vector h points up. But as you go uh, at larger and larger momentum value around the center of the, of, of the of momentum space, 
this PX, PX, PY kick in, the spin wants to point less and less in the North Pole. It spreads out. As you explore it, larger and larger momenta, it spreads out more and more. And eventually, not eventually, but at some point, this becomes zero and then negative. And at large momenta, the spin ends up in the South Pole. And we have a covering of the Bloch sphere, clearly a topological feature. That's the character of a churn band. The churn insulator, it has a whole conductance. And um, now full disclaimer, in a lattice, we would have to replace Px with sine Px and Py with sine Py. But we can do that and, and the momentum space would be limited between minus pi and pi. So this wrapping of the unit sphere is the thing that's essential for a 2D topological phase, the same way that wrapping around a circle was essential for a 1D topological phase. So that's the thing to look out for. Now, I was mentioning anomalous Hall effects. That's something that I want to talk about before we dive deeper as part of this introduction. So how does the sigma xy arise in a churn band, like the one I showed you? Well, we all know what motion in the magnetic field is. We have a force that's proportional, here E is negative, uh, charge of the electron, um, to B cross the velocity, right? We all know this. However, if you think about motion, a very curvature band, we have the same equation, but with the actors uh, mixed. Instead of momentum, we have uh, location. Instead of location, we have momentum. And we get that the velocity, in addition uh, to having a good velocity component for an electron moving in the band, there's another component, which is the Berry curvature, like a magnetic field, cross the force that the electron experiences. And that Berry curvature, like a magnetic field, is a curl of a vector potential but a curl in momentum space of a vector potential momentum space, which is the very connection of the Bloch wave functions are different momenta. So if I teach momenta, the wave function is a spin half object. As we change momentum, the spin changes its orientation. And the vector potential encodes that change of orientation and the very curvature encodes the wrapping around the sphere. It's a local curvature of the spin configuration in a particular place. So in a, 2D, in a 2D band, you can make a map of Berry curvature. Uh, for instance, this one, that's what the Antonia I showed you in the previous page. And every time that the electron goes through a region of high Berry curvature, this term is going to make it move perpendicular. So the Berry curvature is in the Z direction in this context. And if you're forcing the electron to move to the right, if you're putting the force to the right, the electron will actually move with an anomalous velocity perpendicular to your force, just like a massless particle in the magnetic field. So let's, I try to make an animation for that, not a simulation, just a PowerPoint animation. So here's an electron in such a band. I'm pulling it in the X direction. So in momentum space, it has to cross constantly from PX minus to PX plus. And, and again, so the, it will have a motion in the X direction that's associated with the group velocity. That has to integrate to zero. It has to come back to the same X. However, there's a total motion in the Y direction that it can do because of this effective magnetic field, because of this very curve. So that's the mechanism by which this curvature, this wrapping around the unit sphere, gives you this anomalous motion, a sigma xy, a whole conductance. And for the experts amongst you who are not familiar with this too much, I would say that the Berry curvature is really the Pontryagin, the Pontryagin uh, uh, form for the configuration of the spin. It's n dot d momentum x and cross d momentum y x. It's really the curvature of the spin configuration. I think we'll, so, so to end the, the introduction, I'll just say that you know, this physics. Uh -huh. we, have, we have another question from Alex. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, go for it. It's great. Uh, so, so sorry to interrupt. What, what happens with Unclap scattering in this case? The Unclap scattering, the Unclap scattering is uh, in this context can be interactions with other electrons 
that take in a uh, reciprocal lattice vector, right? Well, no, it's just if you accelerate from one side of the Brion zone to the other side, right, then, and keep going, you'll wind back. Ah, I won't call Let it Tokla, but I call it block oscillations. So, yeah, okay, so it's a block oscillation, but, but what happens to the spin? Because you've now wound the spin. Exactly, it's great. So, so here, uh, so the spin continues to do its rotation because what the particle does is, if you see my cursor, you go from the left to the right and then back, from the left to the right and then back, right? The X direction motion repeats itself going back and forth. That's the block oscillation element, yeah. but the unknown velocity is exempt of that. But when, when I go from plus conservation of energy, when I go from plus px to minus px, is there a discontinuous change in no, no, the because it's the, same, it's the same point. Minus pi and plus pi are the same point because you're on the circle. Right. And, and in terms of wave function, plus pi is the wave function plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. So as the, as the electron is, is oscillating backwards and forwards, essentially the spin is then just rotating. So it's like a exactly. it's, oh, so it's it's like an, a block oscillation of spin of momentum, spin momentum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And thinking about block oscillations is really great here because block oscillations are restricted in the direction perpendic uh, parallel to the force by conservation of energy. Yeah. Just you have a limited bend, so you can't take in kinetic energy from the force you're applying. So you have to be, you have to stay in a particular region. Perpendicular to the force, there's no such restriction, which is why this phenomenon can arise. Yeah, thanks for the question. I really thanks. All right, so by now, many, many materials have, uh, have shown this behavior. But the first one to be discovered was mercury telluride, cadmium telluride, after a pr proposal by Andrew Bernovic, Taylor Hughes, and Xu Sheng Zheng uh, 15 years ago. And it was measured by Lawrence Wallenkamp. And um, uh, so, so what they showed is that if you have a sandwich of mercury telluride between cadmium telluride, it's a totally boring semiconductor. But as soon as you make the thickness of the mercury telluride above six nanometers, it becomes topological. And from a boring two-dimensional quantum well, you get a very interesting quantum well with edge states going around the well with you know, clockwise electrons having spin up, for instance, and counterclockwise electrons having spin down. Of course, the direction of the spin depends on the material, etc. So this is an illustration. This is my pastel color illustration, but I plundered the web for a better uh, three-way savvy representation of this. And I came up with this. So uh, credit below. What can you do with this? This is a new material. This is a new type of behavior. It's in solid state. You know, we know what the expectations from solid state physicists are. It has to be useful for something. Maybe for spintronic devices, maybe for dissipationless leaves. Uh, my run of fermions, always on the table. Maybe for quantum computing. All those things are interesting and, um, and had a lot of work done on them over the last 15 years. I want to concentrate on what happens when you combine these topological ideas with light. And in the time that I have left, I'll show you that we can use light to induce topological behavior in semiconductors that are boring. Maybe we can make new topological photonic states. Maybe new paradigms for infrared detection and even new paradigms for controlling photons. Okay, so now I'm done with the introduction, so it's a good time again for asking questions about what I introduced so far. Do you have any questions? I think not yet. Okay, so, so feel free to interrupt. Uh, I'll, I'll stop it a few times to ask for questions, but uh, also feel free to unmute and interrupt. Uh, all right, so a lot on the plate. Let's see how I'll do. Uh, but the point is, whenever you have a system, 
it's nicer when you turn on the light. I think that's the point of this talk. All right, so the first thing, is look at topological insulation. Can we photoinduce topology? And this, is, this was about, this was for me one of the, uh, this was at the beginning of this journey to this light matter topology um, decade that I had. And this started with Victor Gadritsky and Nate Lindner. And I understand Victor is one of the uh, sponsors of this talk as well. So a special thanks for him, to him. Uh, so let's think about a non-topological two-dimensional band, spin orbit coupled, but not enough to make topology. So a valence band with a spin direction, or Newtonian direction that is always in the Northern hemisphere. Starts off at the North Pole, ends up in the North Pole at large momenta, not topological. Let's shine light. Light would create a ring of resonance between the valence band and conduction band. And if we go to a rotating frame, it is as if we bring the two bands together and we see that there are crossings of the energy. Now, before this, blue arrows and red arrows are the projection of the spin direction in the valence and conduction band. And this is a cut through a two-dimensional band structure. We turn on the light, we create the resonance, and that resonance will result in an avoided level crossing. So from a mountain and its reflection, we get a, vol a volcano in its reflection. In this volcano, there's a new spin configuration. At the, at the crater of the volcano, we have a spin down because it's the spin that was in the bottom of the conduction band before. At the edges of the volcano, we get spin up because it's still the edges of the bottom band, it's unaffected. And now if we have the spin going around the equator at the ring of resonance, then we win. We have a topological phase with the pseudo spin wrapping around the inner sphere, as I showed you before, but for a material that didn't have that at first. How that happens? It happens because we have a little bit of spin orbit coupling already in the material that's necessary. Now there's a, let's look under the hood for this and uh, see how this arises. If you have two bands, you can think about the band index as a spin half. But instead of sigma, let's use the letter tau. So here I write the Hamiltonian of these two bands with tau z indicated, indicating uh, plus one conduction band, minus one valence band. Um, so tau z is multiplied by the energy minus the half the energy of, this, of the photon that we're shining. That's just the rotating frame energy with a degeneracy at the ring of resonance. And then, you can mix between the top band and bottom band with the matrices tau x, tau y. The only thing that they can be multiplied by is a complex number that's a function of the momentum. And now what is this complex number G of P? It's, a, it's just a matrix element of an electron state in the valence band steered by the light to overlap with the, with the state in the conduction band at the same momentum. That's a complex number, that's a function of momentum. And the direction of this, of this band pseudospin on the ring of resonance is really just the direction of this complex number in the complex plane. And what is this complex number on the resonance ring? If you play your cards right, then it will be the following. Here's the resonance ring in yellow in Px and Py space. And in each point on this resonance ring, there's this complex number G, which you can write on the complex plane for G, on the G plane, it starts off real, but then it can curve up towards the imaginary and you know, at the Y direction can be fully imaginary, negative imaginary, it's negative real, positive imaginary, negative real and so forth. This complex number can make a winding just the way we like it uh, around the origin of the complex plane. That will guarantee that the spin of the original electron actually wraps around the ring of resonance, wraps around the equator of the Bloch sphere on the ring of resonance. So this, together with the spin going from up on the edges of the band to down on the bottom of the band, sorry, down in the center of the band, that guarantees have a wrapping of the pseudo spin around the Bloch sphere. So if we can make light such that this matrix element never goes to zero, and goes around the origin of the complex plane, we win. Can you do it? Yes. You can use circularly polarized light and uh, or a dark cone 
it'll work. So you can, <clears throat> in order to show that this works, we simulated it. We took a simulation. We have another question from Alex. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Alex, please go forward. Sorry to keep interrupting. Um, no, so no, go ahead. In this system, the, the light is coupling basically your conduction and valence bands and causing the anti-crossing. So does now this, the lifetime of the spin states and the lifetime of those eigenstates now get limited by the coherence time of the laser? Because normally in semiconductors, I try to avoid dumping energy from a laser in because it just heats everything up. Right, it's a great question. Hold on to it as well. Uh, so here we're taking the limit that you're, you're during the time that you still have coherent uh, Rabi oscillations. You could have coherent Rabi oscillations between the two bands. But actually what we want to look at is the Floquet spectrum. Namely, you can diagonalize this problem assuming coherent drive. And if the drive, and, and that, that you cannot absorb energy from that without interaction, you just rearrange your spectrum. Energy absorption comes in when you take into account interactions or the coherence of the light. And we ignore those. Right. Okay. So, so in other words, if your light has got a coherence time of you know a few picoseconds, then that's the that's the lifetime of the spin state of this topological right. state. I mean, you, it won't be the lifetime of the spin state. I mean, you always have the same spectrum, but if you manage to put your electrons in Floquet eigenstates that are stationary in the presence of the drive, right? If you change the drive phase, then those Floquet states would misalign. Yeah. So you to put your electron in, in the Floquet state corresponding to the volcano valence band. If the photon has a facelift, that electron will effectively get excited to the volcano conduction band. Yeah. That would be a limitation on the realizability of this. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So what I wanted to say is that numerically, we don't have any of those complications. We can make this on a lattice. I think this was 200. Uh, what was it? Uh, I think 100 by 20 or something like this. Uh, um, actually, I don't remember what were the, uh, what were the lattice uh, size. I think around 100 by 50 or 100 by 100. But regardless, we put this on the lattice, the same Hamiltonian that I showed you before, with uh, the x direction being periodic, y direction cut, so a cylinder. This is the band structure that we got before. And this is projected onto the x direction. Now we shine light on it, and with with with, with the right with the right polarity, etc., in order to induce uh, the properties we want. And indeed, the Floquet spectrum that emerged had a new again. This is projected, so we see a two-dimensional band projected onto the x direction. Indeed, we see this nice volcano appearing conduction, uh, valence band, conduction band, and edge states, single lines that connect from top to bottom, which represent electronic states moving to the right and to the left in the two sides of the open cylinder. So if you're the god of lightning, now you can put a nice topology badge on your shoulder and you might be happy. Uh, uh, Jill. Yes. Uh, in your previous slide, your effect of electromagnetic field was described by C sigma x and sigma y uh, terms in the Hamiltonian, but heat is sigma z. That's right. Is, so, it, is it important? Yeah, it's important. Depending on what the Hamiltonian is, it's important to tailor the, the light, the oscillating field, to give you a gap. In the Hamiltonian that I showed you before, sigma z is the appropriate one. The magnetic field in the z direction that oscillates, and, and you can kind of imagine why, because the, you see the spin over here, it's pointing along the equator and a little to the north, right? Yes. You want to create, um, um, you want to have uh, something that will mix the spin in the valence band and in the conduction band but only if they point in the xy plane because you want to have it's uh, you want to have something that will be able to give you a finite matrix element for anything in the xy plane and that's only z if you were to use sigma x 
then when the spin were parallel to x, the matrix element would go to zero and you would not have a gap between valence and conduction. So for Hamiltonian like this, sigma z is great. And the sigma z in the oscillating piece will give you an effective Hamiltonian with uh, sigma x and sigma y components along the ring of resonance. Oh, am, am I right? So if you just had vector potential, because you have spin orbit coupling, it is in the uh, sigma x and sigma y, but you also have in sigma z, but you just, it's not important. Yeah, okay. Actually, here you have EP. Great question. Let me elaborate on that. So yeah. the sigma that I put, you should think about as the magnetic field of light. Okay. And then you can have the, the electric field of the light maybe in a direction that's perpendicular to the plane. So you don't care about it. That said, we all know that magnetic field is uh, speed of light suppressed relative to the electric field, which means that if you take this to an experimentalist, they will tell you, hmm, how much field do you want? Hmm, that's very nice. So actually using the electric field is much better. So okay. This, so, the, there's a, so if we, if we were, had time to go deeper, I would show you that actually the way to do this is to use circularly polarized light with field in the plane of the device, such that you can use this spiral coupling to this Px and Py, and that's effectively lets you use the electric field. And that's stronger. That's orders of magnitude stronger. And that's ultimately what was realized. Okay, thank you. That's a great question. So, so any, so to, to wrap up this part of the talk, I say that, you know, I, I can argue about whether it's possible or not, but thankfully there are already two realizations of this. The first one came fairly shortly, fairly close after our discussion New Gedic showed that you can get such floquet states in the surface of, two, of 3D topological insulators. This was the experiment that he and Pablo Herrero were doing. Um, and what you can see here is not so much about topology, but just the floquet copies. They irradiated uh, to the surface of 3D topological insulators. And you can see gaps emerging in some of these plots. This was a realization, but a controversial one, a little controversial, one, a great experiment. And the more clear realization came from uh, Adria Cavallari, uh, I guess with an import from New Gedix group, uh, uh, more recently, very recently, where he took graphene, which has also the right properties. And in fact, uh, a com competing proposal to ours for this Foucault topological insular came from Aoki and Oka. They were talking directly about graphene rather than uh, quantum wells. Um, but the, the physics is the same. You can, um, so what he had is graphene that was irradiated by light. And he looked at sigma xy via a reflection in this chip and showed that indeed, uh, when you irradiate this with infrared light, you get a churn number emerging. And you saw that by a reflection of circularly polarized light from this device. This is a very nice terahertz experiment uh, from Andrea. So yeah, seems to be working. Uh, but all these things were, uh, you know, the radiation was a few tens of picoseconds. The response was shown for a few tens of picoseconds. So this is clearly an ephemeral phase. You cannot keep it going for a long time without doing something. So this, so this Faraday and Kier effect, it's not transport. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's reflectivity. Okay. I would say it's the same as LC transport, but I think actually transport could be interesting because this could give you some kind of a filter. But I think using topology for optical properties is, even, is maybe even the most exciting. Thank you. So, but you know, Questions already arose, like when I gave talks about this, those questions of heating and plausibility over a long time often arise. And that, you know, we have a way of answering this, but that would be a different talk. But every time that I gave this talk and was, uh, and was trying to think about, mm, what do we do with heating? There's another thought that came to mind. Suppose we don't take many photons to create kind of a bend inversion for many electrons that will result in floquet Ed states that are chiral around the surface. Suppose we don't do that. Can we do the same, but with one photon instead of many photons? Can, can we 
just use one photon, have it excite an exciton, and between the photon and exciton, maybe they live under the illusion that they form some kind of a plocketopological insulator and just stay on the edge. Now, I, I didn't quite know whether the physics is right or wrong, but I thought, you know, I speculated what that would be like. So, so if, if there's a photon exciton bound state, it'll have to come from an exciton, which is a particle hole combination, and a photon. And the superposition of the two would be a polariton. Now, if I were to make it topological, then I would be able to call it a topolariton. So given that there's such a great name, I was fully motivated to do the physics. With the benefit of hindsight, I know that the name didn't catch. So luckily we still have the physics to comfort me. So here, how, how, how the physics emerges. So what, what would be the ingredients of these topolaritons? Uh, I have to say topolaritons, I have to advertise, easier to say than transition metal decalcogenize. Just, just something to think about. Uh, okay, so what's in a, a polariton? We, ha we need first ingredient, excitons. These are particle hole bound states. You can excite an electron from the valence band to the conduction band. And the electron in the hole would be bound by Coulomb interaction. And they would propagate together. One thing to remember is that the particle and the hole have to be on opposing sides of the spectrum to have parallel velocity. It has a dispersion with the gap. The gap is the band gap. And as momentum increases, the energy increases. Nothing special, the boson with a gap dispersion. It's an excitation of the semiconductor. What about light? Let's make sure that our photons do not run away by putting them between two mirrors. Let's think of a 2D cavity. And if light is limited in this cavity, then it will also have a dispersion that's similar, speed of light with a small gap because of the finite size. At least in PowerPoint, I can take them and put them together. Here's my semiconductor, here's the cavity. And I can hybridize the photon and the exciton. Now they can move together. They, they should blink out and in because it's really a superposition of exciton and, and photon, but my, sorry, my animation is not good enough for that. And in terms of dispersions, you have the dispersion of the photon and that of the exciton and they're overlaid. Both of them are bosonic. So every time they cross, you can have an avoided crossing. And this is absolute value of momentum. So think about the cylinder in momentum space. And this avoided crossing separates the spectrum to a lower polariton band and an upper polariton band. Now we can think back and make a spin analogy. Let's again use these nice Pauli matrices and think about the Pauli matrix Z telling us whether our our excitation is an exciton or a photon. Tau z plus one, let's say exciton. Tau z minus one, let's say a photon. If that's the case, I can now write the Hamiltonian for this. I won't talk about an identity proportional average energy, just the energy difference. But again, looking under the hood, it's Hamiltonian, some vector of two-dimensional momentum times the tau's. Energy difference between photon and exciton and the matrix element between the photon and the exciton. That matrix element is a complex number as a function of momenta. There's a ring of resonance. There's a ring of degeneracy. What does this G do in that ring? And incidentally, that G is the same one from the Floquet topological insulator. It's just a matrix element between an electron in the valence band, electron in the conduction band with the light matrix in between. So the Z component along this lower polariton, we know, goes from being a photon to being an exciton. It goes from down to up. But the only question is, what does the pseudo spin do in the ring of resonance? So the XY component, again, is this complex number GP. If we engineer things right with spin orbit coupling, that G would have the same winding in the complex plane as I showed you before and we would, we would have a topological lower polariton band. Now, I didn't say this explicitly. People don't say it often explicitly, but topology should translate to some interesting transport properties, either in the bulk or more likely in the edge. There should be some edge state associated with this topological feature. 
Here, we cannot have et states between the two bands because there is no between the two bands, the overlapping energy. So if we want to see the, the, the effects of topology in this, we need two more ingredients. We need an extra potential, some kind of uniform charge density wave that will give you a uh, periodic potential for the excitons, would give you a gap where the et states could live. And we also need to break time reversal symmetry. So we need a magnetic field. Now, this too, I, I, you know, I could talk about plausibility of this proposal, but I don't need to anymore. So lucky for me, uh, the Technion and Wurzburg groups, uh, so Zamit and Hoefling group, have realized this in an indium arsenide uh, uh, structure that had this periodic honeycomb lattice potential, had the magnetic field, had the spin orbit coupling, and indeed what they observed is in the infrared, nice edge propagation of topological polariton. Seen here in illustration, seen here in bent structure with a nice gap emerging with topological states in between. And here's the demonstration of light that's being put in at some point and propagating primarily on the edge. That's a nice demonstration of this. And uh, I forgot to ask in the beginning, do the talks run 50 minutes or an hour? Uh, it is uh, for now, but we, we could happy to continue. Uh, no, hour, yes. hour is better than fifty minutes. Let's see if I can uh, if I can get my message. So, so you know, we, we, are, we are happy to continue. So, yeah, thanks. I don't want to stretch anybody's uh, patience. Uh, but questions. Uh, I have a question. I have yeah. a question here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much, Gil, for the very nice presentation. Yeah. I have a question about uh, flow quit uh, topological insulator. Mm -hmm. So you, you talk about the uh, anomalous Hoare effect. Uh, mm -hmm. My question, uh, I have two questions is can the anomalous uh, Hoare effect uh, uh, be quantized? Second question is, and the light radiation, we should have uh, both electron and holes. Yeah, how does, uh, 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 would uh, both electron and hole contribute to the uh, edge state? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, 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 I still have some things to say, so I'm, I'm not wrapping up yet. <laughs> okay, uh, no worries. Uh, that's a very great question. So typically, the edge states in a floquet topological insulator, yeah. An exact mix of the oh. electron hole. Exact mix, half up. So if you quench into it, half of your states would be occupied and half would be empty at random. Oh. And um, the topology emerges in the state between the particle and the hole. So it's really oh. the phase between the particle and the hole that contributes as much as the spin orbit coupling. Oh. So the spin orbit coupling comes together with the light matrix element to give you this. Yeah. And, and there has been a lot of work actually on quenches of topological cocaine insulators, um, which we're trying to look at how this topology emerges. If you're say in a partial band or you're looking at the edges. So I think in offhand uh, VT Mitra in NYU and Michael Kolodrobets in Texas, we're thinking about things like that, Anatoly Polkovnikov as well. Um, right. All right. Yeah. So, thanks. Anything else so far? The polaritons and so okay, topological insulators. Uh, yeah, I might have a question. Go for it. Uh, yeah, so I was wondering, it seems to me that for this topological polariton effect, uh, there is an important ingredient, which is that uh, uh, photonic modes in 2D are TE or TM. And that, in some sense, um, this realization is analog to the Holdain model from 2008, mm -hmm. which was using only light, but breaking, uh, op okay, opening a topological gap for, for, for light using a Faraday effect. Mm -hmm. While here, uh, this Faraday effect is provided for polariton by this exciton, excitonic part which has a Zeeman response to an external magnetic field. 
Um, so do you agree with this or do you think it's different uh, yeah. than the yeah, old game model from 2008? Yeah, so, so let, let me say the following. So my experience as a condensed matter theorist is that, you know, I, I worked something out, I worked really hard, and then I look very carefully at the literature and I see that what I've done invariably was done to a large degree, 90 degree done. And then I can take comfort from the last 10%. That was almost always my experience in condensed matter. This is no exception. So after we've done this and we thought about it, what did we actually do? We have a way of getting topological phase for photons. Of course, Haldane did it before. So I would say that, I would say it's the extra 10% that I would take credit for. But of course, the original idea is very, is very similar to what Haldane did. Of course, what Haldane did was using Faraday effect. But OK, that's magnetic field. I'm also using magnetic field. So, so if you take the components, yes, you can take all those components. And, um, and, 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 and they're almost one to one. In that sense, topological phases are universal. You realize one, you can say that you realize all of them. Yeah, but okay. There's an extra 10%. The extra 10% here is that, you know, our Dane model with, with uh, Shirago was realized in microwave cavity. In yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and even the, the link between the two is not uh, that really yeah. obvious, but, but it's just, I just wanted to, to know if you agree. Yeah, yeah. I totally yeah. agree. This is, okay. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, the way I thought about it was from this Fouquet topological insulator, but then you realize, ah, uh, where's that 90% with Duncan? No escape. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, right. All right, so I was promising some infrared devices, but I'll just push through because I'm excited to talk about the last part. So topological insulators give you surfaces and even bulk phases in vile semi-metals which have no gap and have spin orbit locking. If you think about uh, uh, trying to detect, of course, you know, this is good for my Uranus, but this is not about my Uranus. But what I wanted to say is that if you want to detect infrared light, you're in trouble unless you want to detect uh, near infrared light. So for detecting infrared light, you usually use a semiconductor with a gap that's a little below the energy of the light you want to detect. The lower the frequency of the light, the harder it is to get those materials and the colder you need to get. So here's, a, here's the landscape of infrared detection. If you're near visible light, near one micron, you're good. Many materials, if you're going towards the right, towards 10 microns, 30 microns, your options are going away and your quality of detection, your detectivity also goes away. And what can give you these detectors? Oh, here you start seeing familiar materials, indium antimonide, mercury, cadmium, telluride. Those are familiar players from topology, but not in topological insulator form. They're just alloys, and alloys can have small gap. But maybe having this gapless spin orbit uh, locked materials gives you another opportunity for infrared low frequency detection, because you can always excite along this gap. And the spin orbit coupling gives you a direction for electron flow in response to light. That was an idea we had with uh, Felix von Oppen and Nate Lindner back in 2014. Um, and we saw that on the surface of topological insulator, you can do that if you, if you uh, plant along an antiferromagnet in rows, then you get a nice current in response to circularly polarized light along the rows. I'm not, I'm not going to dwell, I just want to advertise so if you calculate the electronic response, ignoring phono, but you calculate the electronic response to such light in such a setup as a function of temperature. Now, if you want to, dis to detect like 10 micrometer light, that's about room temperature light. You would expect that you cannot detect room temperature energy light in room temperature because of thermodynamic constraints. And here we're not trying to get work out of the light, we're just trying to detect. The constraints are a little fewer. And indeed, if you look at the detectivity, uh, this graph represents the detectivity. If you look at it at zero temperature and at room temperature or at the temperature of the black body radiation you're trying to detect, it only falls off by a factor of uh, two thirds to a half. 
So it gives you the hope of room temperature detection. Phonons make it worse. That's, but, but it's interesting. So we might have a room temperature infrared detector like this. And it's even better with wild semi-metals. So this was work that we've done. The wild semi-metals, they have this dirac like crossing protected. It has arc states going around. But it's the Dirac crossing we're interested in. If you shine light, you can create a resonance. If the vial nodes are uh, anisotropic because of some shift, then this ring of, ring of resonance falls off kind of lopsided. If the chemical potential in this material is somewhere, say, in the balance band, only part of the ring gets expressed. And you can get a directional current just from exciting across this gap taking advantage of the spin orbit coupling of the vial node and its gaplessness. So if you want to, uh, to hear more about this, ask me after, after we wrap up. I'll just say that this too, so this gives a directional current. This too was observed in experiment, again, by Nugetic for zinc, uh, for zinc telluride. And even better uh, in tantalum arsenide uh, by Ken Birch, it looked at smaller films, thinner films and got Huge, huge currents result. So if I'm allowed for another five minutes. Uh, sure, uh, definitely. We are, we are happy to continue. Okay, so let me take another five minutes or so to talk about a paradigm for manipulating light using topology. So the idea is that the drive gives you an extra dimension. Now, I was really looking hard for some graphics on the web that will illustrate this idea that periodic drive could be an extra dimension. But I couldn't find it. I, so as a compromise, I got this. I don't know, some of you were not alive when this was, uh, actually I wasn't alive when this was filmed, the time tunnel. Uh, it was a show about time travel where these two individuals were going from time to time fixing things. And they were going through this tunnel. And I think it was supposed to convince kids that if you go through a periodic structure in space, you can travel along something like a time direction. I want the opposite. If you go through a periodic structure in time, it makes you feel like you're traveling in space. So that's what I want to say. This is the idea. This is the Cold War uh, post color rendition of this. And uh, it's very Cold War aesthetics there. And this is the idea of synthetic dimensions. This is a nice show. If you want some retro uh, shows, you. you not happy with Marvel or something. So the synthetic dimension idea gives, an, gives the possibility for new control paradigm for light. So what I'll show you now is how to take two dimensional topological insulator and realize it in a zero dimensional system using two beams of light. So here it goes. So I want to think about, again, the Floquet system. So I have a periodic drive. Here's a Hamiltonian for a periodic drive. But I want a slow drive, maybe small frequency, large amplitude. I want the dynamics of a wave function. I just write the wave function as a function of time and extend it in harmonics of the drive. This is not unique, it's just instructive. And now I can write a wave, a wave equation, a Schrodinger equation for this component psi n of the resonance. Invariably, it will look like a tight binding model in the space of photon number at n. How many photons did I take from the drive? There will be a slope because each photon that I take from the drive has energy omega. But now this number of photons is a synthetic dimension. It's like a space dimension. Can I do it in two dimensions? Why not? Here's two dimensions. I'll have two drives, omega one and omega two, incommensurate, and I can expand any uh, time evolved wave function in terms of double harmonics. Again, not unique, but instructive. I plug this into time dependent Schrodinger equation. Invariably, I get the Schrodinger equation for a tight binding lattice for photons from drive one, photons from drive two. And there's a force in this space. Why is this force? Omega one in the one direction, omega two in the two direction. You have to pay for the energy of the photons you take. But interestingly, motion is restricted in the direction parallel to the frequency because of conservation of energy. But it's unrestricted perpendicular to the omega vector. So photons can go from drive one to drive two 
with no problem, as long as the system, the driven system doesn't get to keep any energy because it has a finite bandwidth. And the width of this red stripe, that's the bandwidth of the Hamiltonian. That's conservation of energy. People like saying that in a driven system, you don't have conservation of energy. But actually, if you think where it emerges, you can have some extra insights. Okay, this is two-dimensional synthetic dimensions. Now, I promised a total order. Two-dimensional topological phase, zero dimensions. How do I do that? Here's a two-dimensional Cairn band, like I showed you, on the lattice. Sine Px, sine Py, cosine Px, cosine Py. I'm going to change Px to omega 1t, change Py to omega 2t. Now, instead of having a two-dimensional band for electrons, I have a spin half that's just driven by two elliptically polarized beams. One in the x y in the xz direction and the other in the yz direction. And one of them, the topological aspect of this will make sure that one of the beam becomes stronger at the expense of the other beam. This would be a frequency converter. This is work done with Ivor Martin and Bert Hopper and the continues, uh, right. So, so what, what happens if this, if this is the case? So let's think about semi-classical motion. An electron in a two-dimensional band would have this representation. But this two-dimensional band in terms of Px and Py is now the, described with P1 that's omega 1t, P2 that's omega 2t. And again, we have the same two-dimensional band structure with some very curvature, but a force that's, that's dictated by this omega. So what do I have here? Instead of momentum, two-dimensional space, I have two phases of the light basically. That's like momentum. And then there's a conjugate, there's a, uh, there's a conjugate space, which is instead of location, it's a synthetic dimension, number of photons. N1 and N2. And now I'm applying the force, the frequency that's in this direction. There should be no motion along the direction of omega except for Bloch oscillations back and forth. But as we go through the Brillouin zone in the right sequence, every time that we go through a large Berry curvature, there's going to be an anomalous motion perpendicular to the force. And again, the force is just the frequency cost of photons. So every time that we go through very curvature, we pump photons from source one and we give them to source two. How many photons? Well, the anomalous velocity from the semi-classical equations of motion is just the very curvature cross the force. Very curvature cross the frequency vector. And when we average the Berry curvature over the entire band structure in 2D, we just get the chain number. What this translates to, if you calculate the work done from source one, work done from source two, it's omega one times the motion along the one direction, omega two times the motion along the two direction. You read this off from here and you see that invariably we're getting this. One source gives energy, turn number over two pi, omega one, omega two. The other source gets energy, turn number over two pi, omega one times omega two. That's a universal, that's a universal uh, rate of frequency conversion, of energy conversion, of pumping energy from drive one, from drive two to drive one in this, uh, in this diagram. Uh, you may think of replacing this with a vial semi-metal where the Hamiltonian really looks like sigma dot something of momentum in shining light. And that's work that we're going to publish in the next couple of weeks with Frederick Nathan and Ibra Martin on how that would happen. So it turns out you can realize this vial, vial semi-metal if the relaxation time would be 100% longer. And then you can make vial semi-metal into this nonlinear frequency converter. Anyway, I was going through this a little fast. So if you want to ask questions, please feel free. But for those of you who want to log out, let me just put up my uh, conclusions of this. Uh, just in terms of advertisement, new opportunities in this field, uh, you can think about flattening non-magic angle twisted bilayer graphene with light. 
you can do that very effectively in form array patterns, form array materials that was done with Orcats and Nate Lindner just last year. And you can also think about realizing more exotic Floquet phases, most recently Floquet higher order topological insulators, so-called Flotties, that's the name I like, which was uh, worked on at Caltech with uh, my students, Swati Ch Chalhari, Obel Chaim, Yang Tang, who's a professor in Northridge uh, over the past two years. Okay, so, so here are the conclusions. We went through a big adventure, okay, topological insulators, topological polar polaritonic states. We thought maybe topological insulators can give you a new class of photo detectors, and that's something that, that has taken off. And the latest thing is the idea of using topological ideas to control light and then bringing it back into the solid state uh, regime to create new nonlinear photo amplifiers, which would be the next goal. Let me, let me stop here and I, I have gotten over even by my standards. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you for keeping with me and I'm opening for questions. Uh, thank you, Chil, for a great talk. Uh, uh, do we have a uh, question? So we have a question from Jared in the chat. From Jared Cole. Uh, let me open the chat somewhere. Jared, are you still here? Please go forward. Do you want me to just say it? Sure. Um, so, so I've read lots about topological flow K with circularly polarized light, etc. But I'm wondering whether people have looked at um, higher angular momentum states of light, because in quantum optics, there's this whole industry looking at if you impart helical wave fronts on photons, you can do lots of interesting stuff because you get the interplay between the spin and the orbital degrees of freedom in the photon. Have people looked at what happens when you have that kind of momentum and a material that would be normally a flow KTI? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Actually, exactly what you're asking. So I want to say this is a frontier that I, uh, that I haven't worked on. It's one of the directions that I find fascinating, but didn't get a chance to explore. And uh, part of it is because I'm an amateur uh, optics person. I'm not, I, mean, I come from the solid state. So, but my good friend, Danny, Daniel Podolsky had the same idea and he tried to figure out what happens exactly when uh, you do what you say. And you create a vortex with uh, quantized states in there. Hmm. Like there's a state pinned to zero energy. But I think there's, you know, this, this uh, question goes beyond that. So, so that particular thing, like the TI I described with the light field that has a phase encoded onto it was looked at by Daniel Podolsky um, maybe seven years ago, six years ago or so. And he worked out what happens and, and other consequences. But I think there were other works following that who, that looked at more complicated drive schemes and um, the interplay of the spatial and the momentum space in this. But Danny, Danny's work is the one to start with. Cheers, thanks. Yeah, all right, when? Uh, I have a question. Is it possible to engineer the edge for the synthetic dimension, for this fancy uh, synthetic oh, dimension? Yeah, yeah we're wondering the same question. You know, I was looking at the bulk properties, so to speak. But like I said, you know, by my own standards, topology is expressed at the edge. Uh, more often than in the buck, and uh, um, it looks hard. But we figured out a way, a way, not the best way, uh, with Yuval Baum, we tried to look at precisely this question. So we wrote up a paper on how you can use history dependence to produce an edge. Because what is an edge in synthetic dimension? Synthetic dimension comes from the time. So time, the phase winds, the phase is like the time. So you want, uh, you want a potential in the coordinate conjugate to the phase, conjugate to the time. So you want the time derivative. So if you can write down a potential that's a function of time derivative, then you're in business. Potential in terms of time derivative is the same as having history dependence in your Hamiltonian. And how can you realize that? So you can, for instance, so think about a, um, a spin, 
If you want a synthetic dimension, one dimension synthetic dimension, think of thin that's being put in an annulus. So, so let, let me go back a second. So, so if you look at my, my screen for a second, so there's a net state of this topolariton. Let's make use of it. So think about taking a quantum Hall state, just integer quantum Hall state, and make kind of a uh, omega shaped hole in it, such that the electrons are forced to go in, make a circle, and then go out. And let's assume that the electrons also have a spin that can fully interact. Now let's put a spin that we're driving in the middle of this omega, such that as soon as the electrons from the whole effect, from the whole edge, come into that uh, annulus, they start interacting with your spin. They start encoding, or at least the states, start encoding the spin state of the central spin. And then as they move around, they impart it back. You can write this as a history-dependent Schrodinger equation. It's like the spin in the center sees reflections of itself from times past to these propagating states. That, now, if you can engineer your hopping from the central spin to the annulus, to the edges, kind of like etch it with some periodicity, with some function, that's actually quite simple. Then you can get uh, the equivalent to a synthetic dimension confinement with a box, uh, with, with, the, with the box potential. So the long, <laughs> it's a long answer to the simple question. Yeah. Uh, but that's how you, you would have to do it. You would have to have some history dependence, and then you have to work hard from the solid state perspective. Now, going back. So it is H in time. Yeah. So, so, this, so then you get an edge in photon number. That's a complicated way. There's a simpler way of getting edge in photon number. If you use a photonic cavity, then you can't get negative number of photons. That's an easier way. So then you have a natural edge, but also the amplitude of the coupling depends on the number of photons, so that gives other complications. That's, that's another way of making an edge. And then another answer I'll advertise uh, from Mikhail uh, Rechtsman thought about a similar question, but his answer was, let's use nonlinear optical states. If you have nonlinearity, that's almost like a potential in photon number. That will also give you confinement of states like around an edge. Which I, I find fascinating, actually. Yeah. Very unusual. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any other question? We have a question from Abai Gupta who asks to tell it. What links topological phase with having an edge state? Is it to do with the fact that when electron and material reach its edge, the non-zero barrier phase leads to having perturbed motion? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I think it's, it, you can think about these terms and there are many ways of answering this. And I'll, I'll tell you the first thing that comes to mind. If you have this topological phase that I showed, you have a chain number one, but it has to come, you cannot have a single band with chain number one without having another band with chain number minus one. You saw it very easily with my spin uh, configuration for, for the Hamiltonian gives you spin down states and spin up states. And uh, you would have to have chain number one with chain number minus one. Uh, now, if you think of transferring electrons continuously, um, like accelerating them continuously with the field, then the cycle that you can imagine is that with sigma xy, you can take, so I'll, I'll use this diagram again, you can take electrons with sigma xy uh, with an electric field in the, let's call this the y direction, you can take electrons in the x direction, right? But then you will accelerate them on the edge state, right? And then they'll connect. So if you, if you just have sigma xy, you'll get stuck with a lot of electronic states on the edge if there was no edge state, right? So whenever you have a sigma xy and you're accelerating, you're trying to accelerate the electrons, but they move perpendicular. So field in this direction, they move perpendicular. Uh, when they get to the edge, if they don't have anywhere to go, then you're in trouble with spectral properties of Schrodinger equation. 
So where do they go? They go to an edge state. And then they accelerate in the edge state in the sense that they go to higher and higher momentum. They get absorbed. Yeah, here. So, so you go to the edge state, and then you get accelerated to higher and higher momentum, momentum, and you end up in the top band. Top band, churn number, is opposite. So if you went from the left to the right, then you get excited to the edge state with the same field going in the plus y direction. You get excited to the top band, and then the chair number is opposite. You go back, and then you relax into the bottom band and do it again, again, again. So, so in order to have this motion momentum space with an electric field, in order to have the sigma xy, which is a consequence of this topological physics, you have to have an edge state in order to avoid anomalies associated with just, just the properties of the Schrodinger equation. That's the most direct one. Now there's an indirect one, which is um, if you look at solutions of the Schrodinger equations on the edge, you know, we can, we can write Schrodinger equation even for a free particle in the box potential. And uh, we know that we can, we can write bound states on the edge with exponentially decaying wave function. The only problem is that they're the energy would be, uh, the, sorry, the only problem is that they won't obey boundary conditions. So that's why we exclude them. We know, I mean, there, there are imaginary momentum solutions of Schrodinger equations in the bulk, it's just they never obey, uh, it's, uh, they never obey boundary conditions. If you have these two spin components, and you try to do the same exercise, you find out that when that matrix element G that I keep advertising winds around the origin of the complex plane, this is one-to-one -one equivalent to having a solution that's exponentially decaying from the edge that obeys boundary conditions. And that's a universal property that's associated with this. So that's, uh, that's another way where the topology dictates these edge states. It's like the properties of the Schrodinger equation are altered uh, by the topology, and very often you can track down the topology to a single number that is a function of momentum, goes around the origin of the complex plane. It's kind of a fun exercise to do. Okay, uh, thank you. If we don't have any so, other questions. Okay. Dimitri, sorry, uh, I have a, have a, sorry, sorry, Gil, for uh... No, Just no, one question. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> well, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> Hopefully, you can travel again soon. Uh, look, sorry, sorry to take more of your time. Look, very nice talk. Just, just a very naive question, and I think I'm sure you already had this question. So, if I go to the lab and I perform this experiment, let's say related to your first topic, I'm going to create hot electrons, right? So. I'm going to populate some states that are initially unpopulated. And I, I, am I going to perturb that spin texture that you have? For example, I'm, I'm a, is it going to resolve in, result in magnetization of my material? And if so, because now I have spins that are pointing one way in the balance band, but now I'm populating states in the conduction band that have another, another spin. Would that result in extra terms in your Hamiltonians, in your Hamiltonian and then? Um... Right. So, so, so let me break the question down a little bit. Um, so, so when you shine light as a quench, you're going to create, you're going to uh, have as a result a mix of electrons in the valence band and conduction band of the volcano band structure. So, and that won't show a lot of topological features. So that, that would be a mess if you do it as a quench. Um, uh, but um, see, I think I can do a hole. Um, right. So if you do that, um, that would be a mess. And that would heat up the system in the sense that you won't have anything coherent to look at. Now, but the system is not interacting the way I described it. So the, the way that the system would actually heat up is because it has interactions. But I didn't realize I'm uh, so uh, so far away from this diagram. Uh, there it is. Yes. Uh, right. So you're going to have like mixture of electrons in this band and in that band. Topology 
would be still observable if you manage to access the edge states in between directly by some kind of a point contact or something like that. If you have interactions, then that would result in heat. That, that will dissipate into heat. Now, and then you're asking about uh, uh, spin texture. Yes, yeah. So you want, generically you won't create magnetization because your spin direction would average to zero. So you create exciton, excitations kind of like uniformly around. So you won't, you won't necessarily get magnetization. Now, if you do the same kind of ex exercise in a vial sand metal, which has some tilted nodes and other central symmetric breaking properties, you might. In the same way that I get like some uniform directionality of electron flow due to uh, infrared irradiation at the level of uh, Fermi Golden Rule, you might get magnetization as a result if you have like coherent oscillations because there, there won't be a cancellation necessarily. Yeah, I'm just wondering if in those cases where you might have some magnetization now, so I saw that your Hamiltonians, they don't, they seem to not ex, uh, explicitly include, for example, exchange or uh, effects of magnetization. That's uh, right, so I don't have any interaction in the story. Yeah. And uh, I would say that the, the question leads uh, the question leads to different directions of research that some were taken. One is, suppose you have interactions, can you mitigate uh, heating effects? That you can do by attaching your system to a particularly engineered bath. You can engineer the phonons such that they always work in a way to cool in the Fouquet basis. Mm -hmm. You can also couple to electronic baths that have a very narrow bandwidth that will also cool the Fouquet basis. Um, and then you can think about driving uh, things like Heisenberg models. You can think about driving things like antiferromagnets. That's something that David Che is trying to do, for instance, in order to manipulate antiferromagnets. It's, it's a bit of a different place in parameter space than what we're trying to do because he's trying to suppress uh, or modify the exchange interaction itself rather than dress the electrons into an interesting many bodies state. But it's the same, you know, it's different language for, for the same thing. And that's very interesting. And again, people are concerned about heating, but I think so far, it seems like heating is not so bad. The problem is that uh, heating is not so bad such that you melt the system, but you often produce just simple metals. So you want to create a nice magnetic state, you want to create an antiferromagnet. What ends up being is that you dynamically move your system from the low entropy phase to the high entropy phase, not necessarily the same as heating. I mean, you can show that the times in which you return to your phase is different than the time that it takes to dissipate the heat. So it's a slightly different effect. And uh, this hints at conserved quantities that linger in your system. So it hints at the direction of many body scars. So there was a lot of research into systems that are driven and nonetheless only, uh, only heat up on a very long time scale, like exponentially long time scale. And they have a pre, an interesting pre-thermal state. So I think one direction in which I can take this question is that we can think of manipulating an interesting magnetic model and looking for magnetization in the pre-thermal state, which may have been done. So this is the kind of thing that uh, Maxim Serbin and Roman Vassar and, and, and um, hey, hey, you're right that the uh, the heating is another time scale, right? I mean, it's going to be yeah. a lot longer. So yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. but other star of this. Anyway, yeah, th th thanks so much, Gil. Sorry for taking no, it's very, it's a very rich field, and, and the questions, yeah, there are a lot of questions there. When you bring it to the experiment, so right now I would say that all the realizations are clean. They're in time scales where interactions don't play a role yet, where you isolate the system very nicely, the way the Cavallari did, for instance. And like Dimitri was saying, you're looking at indirect measurements like care effect. You're not, you're not. You're strangling the electrons to do what you want. And I think the next stage would be to incorporate uh, insights 
into scar states on the one hand and bath engineering on the other to get a fully many body uh, picture of this driven, driven phases. And that has been challenging. I think, I think we had a, a similar discussion when we met in Germany and, and, uh, uh, and, and things evolved on the theory side and the experiment is very, very difficult. I, can, I, I agree. I saw it from David's, David Che's uh, side. So there's progress. Yeah, so thanks for the question. So it's all a fascinating thing to think about, as you can see with me not being able to stop talking about it. <laughs> yeah, th thank thanks you. so much. And uh, yeah. Thank you. See, see you more, yeah. Do you have any other questions? Actually, I do. I have a question about your last idea. Uh, perhaps you already mentioned it. I just missed it, but I'm a little confused about energy conservation in that last idea. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> if I look at your cartoon, um, <clears throat> you essentially, you can go to your conclusion slide or either one. It's fine. I think this is a good one to talk about energy conservation. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you go to the next one, which has the, the beams. There you go. Okay, so imagine I take a, uh, in your picture, I send in some green photons and some red photons, and it looks like you've removed a red photon and you've produced a green photon. Um, so it doesn't go like that. I'm sorry to interrupt. But you shouldn't think about them as one photon goes to another photon. It's in the limit but, of strong drive, but the photons are not quantized. But isn't that your picture of your periodic structure? No, it's not uh, photon yeah. number. Oh, no, that is the structure. Okay. That is the structure. Sorry for interrupting. I know because I know this is a confusing point, so I really apologize for interrupting. Uh, but you see, the way that you're going to convert the photons is along this slope that's perpendicular okay. to omega. So if we had the slope that say, you know, it has to be non-commensurate ratio to be fully kosher. Actually, the effect is stronger if you take a rational ratio. It's just not quantized. And um, so suppose you have like ratio of two to five. Then this slope would be two over five. I see, okay. And then the motion on it, Precisely in order to conserve energy would be such that you convert, say, if I take this slope, so, so you convert, say, five and one photon into two and two photons. And because we're in the limit where the photon amplitude is large, then we can't talk about, uh, so we're not in the atomistic limit of the photon number, which means that the wave function of my Fourier state has to be spread out in this space. In, in this space. The, the, the wave function of my system has to be, you know, has to overlap several of these sites. It's, it's not, N1 and N2 are not a good quantum number. Okay, all right. That's how it fits together without breaking conservation of energy. Okay, so it is fundamentally quite different than multi-wave mixing in, in quantum optics. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be the competition, right? OPA, OPG combinations. Where you have special matching condition works in the infrared, um, yeah. So and, and there, I mean, your matching conditions kind of limit you a little bit in terms of what. Yeah. But also in, in that situation, I can understand things from a photon picture. So. Yeah, and here no. Okay. <clears throat> All right. But the, the, that that's exactly the Achilles' heel of this. You can only do this. Well. So you you can start doing this only if the amplitude of your light is is stronger than certain threshold. That's like uh, about, I don't know, like 50%, 30% of the frequency of the light. So you have to start with a strong beam to begin with and it's hard to get uh, this beyond microwave. And you have this on the archive already or not yet? Yeah, so there's a series of papers looking at uh, things like this and the way to look for them is uh, by my last name and Martin. Okay. Uh, M A R J N V R. So we collaborated in all the series and the different aspects of this. Uh, I, I hope to publish uh, the analysis for the vile semi metals in the next couple of weeks. 
We're wrapping it up. And I, I can send you the links if uh, you don't find it. Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, there was a realization of this experimentally, in quotes. Somebody simulated this on uh, on the IBM quantum computer. Okay. <laughs> So the, there's a qubit realization of this <laughs> from, from December of 2020. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, maybe I have a, a small question regarding this part as well. So if I understand well, you have a, a spin uh, and then you mentioned veil semi-metal or uh, so, so, so I, I was wondering um, then the, the, you have, I mean, um, is there, uh, then you have electrons and uh, this, uh, 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 I mean, they have momentum, there are this kind of stuff. Does it play any role in, in, the, in this story? Um, not so, so I couldn't hear the question very well. Could you repeat it? It just maybe I can rephrase it like, uh, what can be this uh, the spin in, in some experiments mm -hmm. in this kind of um, because a qubit is really a two level system, as but uh, a veil semi metal for or veil, maybe it's a bit different and so this this is not clear uh, yeah yeah this is a great question so so right. i would say that first of all this effect that i was showing we came across it as a quantum effect but then we realized it's really a, a classical effect and and there's a similar realization that was done in chicago where they put uh, uh william irving was, was uh uh putting a bunch of tops together and showing topological estates and it has the same flavor so even if you take a classic magnet and, and, and do this irradiation on it, the classical motion would give you this pumping effect. Um, just, you know, LLG equations would give you this. Um, so then when we go to the, but, you know, the quantum approach is good, it's simple for us. Uh, but when you go to vial semi-metals, let me, let me show the Hamiltonian for vial semi-metal. Um, I think I had that somewhere here. Yeah. So look at it. It's p dot sigma. Now, if you think of each momentum as a spin half that we're going to use as a transducer, then we have a bunch of them working kind of in tandem. Each one of them, each electron. So this, so each electron has a certain momentum. Think about it as a magnetic field. And then on top of that, we irradiate. So then by minimal coupling, it will be P minus A, P minus EA, or P plus EA in the convention that I used before. So as Dimitri mentioned before, I mean, that's the way that we would couple light. Uh, so then, um, but then your Hamiltonian would be A dot sigma. So it will be A dot sigma plus P dot sigma. P dot sigma, constant magnetic field. A dot sigma, to drive from the two beams of light. Right? It will be exactly the right kind of shape. I wanted sine omega t times sigma x, uh, sine omega 2t times sigma y. I can do that by aligning my beams right. Um, the problem is that, so each momentum state is an independent agent. And those electrons, they're, they're like ants without being able to organize themselves into the right direction. It might all push in random directions and give you zero effect. So what we worked hard to show is that you, you do get an effect if you have a, uh, a, a type a, a, a tilted uh, vial semi-metal. So if you don't have full symmetries for the vial uh, node kind of like this, then you can get uncompensated effect. Uh, and the problem for making it into a fully uh, nonlinear optical transformer is that the heating relative to the pumping is large unless the relaxation time goes to the tens of nanoseconds. So we just looked at the you know, bare bones version, vial semi-metal, 
driven, Boltzmann, uh, Boltzmann relaxation. And I should advertise this, uh, we're wrapping up our work, but already since the summer, there's uh, work along similar lines, although not much overlap uh, from, uh, 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 from Oka, uh, from Dresden. Um, and um, uh, again, so from these bare bones, uh, you can show that there's an effect. You can evaluate eating just because of relaxation in the valsner metal. You compare that to how much pumping you get. And you see that in order to get uh, break even, so you take beam number two, you try to pump energy into it. You want to pump more energy than beam two dissipates. With that, you need about like, I think 10 nanoseconds relaxation. But relaxation is typically like one picosecond one to 10 picosecond in this material. So, there's, so now we need to think about going, um, going away from the bare bones model where, okay, we know how to do uncompensated bile, combining all those electronic degrees of freedom, but also eliminate sources of relaxation systematically. Maybe use like finite size corrections, maybe use like finite size devices where the hot spot momenta are excluded, things like that. Um, but yeah, so, so I hope I answered the question. So the idea is you have many spin half degrees of freedom in parallel to each other, and you need to engineer them to work in tandem along the same direction. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and yeah, other questions? We have very strong audience. Yeah, you're, you're showing perseverance. This is a lot of fun. So it's almost like the real thing. Well, it'd be nice to see everybody in person, but it's uh... yeah. Okay, uh, everybody just escaped from the lockdown and eager for discussions. Yeah, hopefully, uh, by the end of the summer, it will be done. I don't know if you winter. Okay, uh, if there is no any other questions, Gil, thank you again. It was a fantastic talk. We are very, very excited and thank you for accepting the invitation. Yeah, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Uh, so thanks. Uh, yeah, so take good care. I guess I'll, I'll log off as well. Uh, thank you all for attending.